Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another round of the T6 Motorsport Super Touring Championship. This week takes us to our second trip to Japan. Of course, uh, the inaugural round was at Suzuka. Today, we head to the Twin Ring Motegi. Myself, Zach Sweeney, Dara Thacker alongside me in the commentary booth uh, as we talk you through each and every single bit of racing action this evening. Dara, of course, we're chucking along quite nicely already on to week four and already it's hot enough to be a fairly good championship. Yeah, it's been a very good opening few weeks uh, in the Super Touring Championship, and I think we're in for a good run all the way to the end of the season. We've had some good tight racing, uh, good competitive battles in the championship as well, and I do think that we're starting to see that success ballast kind of help keep the championship quite close, uh, but Motegi is surely going to be another absolute cracker of an evening. Oh, I do not doubt it for one bit. Speaking of the championship, then, let's take a quick look as to how things are racking up in the championship. As you can see, it's Gaspar Mrak that leads the way, but only two points of the all-consistent Russian driver, uh, of course, of Pavel Mukonin. Uh, Greg Kujek there on 74, not a million miles away either. Alessandro Ottaviani, after missing last time out, of course, is uh, a little bit far down, but don't forget they do get one drop week uh, to be added to their score, so he could well still be firmly in the mix. Uh, Matej Mikovic, the Hungarian, rounds off the top five with Marvin Mackin, there of course in sixth albeit slightly differently you can see there the cup he is yet to score a podium and is therefore the highest placed driver to do so Christian Orban bench Farkas just in behind in seventh and eighth with Christian Juhash there rounding off the top ten uh, behind that you can see the likes of Sven Mackenberg who did a really good job I believe a podium uh, at the back end of last week Shores Oyser, Michael Clough Pascal jean Piet, uh, and then of course Nenad Vanislavlovic uh, uh, and then uh, Stu Neil to round off the top 15 drivers uh, obviously then there's a couple more drivers uh, to come a few more uh, that have scored at points the likes of Victor Bernat Rubio Jacek Kovalevsky Marius Zabdi who's not quite in got to the, uh, the the swing of things as of yet the two-time runner-up really needs something just to catalyse his season Sergei Mukumov Fraser Rostans uh, Matty Kozlov and Simon Tribek the last of the drivers who have scored points uh, the rest of them yet to do so in that championship though Dara we have got many a contender so many people so far this season have taken to the podium top fives wins etc and as we head towards the back end of the first half of the championship, we are sort of starting to see so many different people come to the come to fruition. Yeah, and it's good to see. It's good to keep the, uh, the championship plodding along nicely uh, in total. I think we've got a lot of these guys who, uh, you mentioned Dr. Viani, he wasn't here last week, but he does have the pace. There are some drivers in there that can perform very well and very consistently all the way through the season that are just picking up points for the time being. Uh, and the fact that we have, uh, you know, weekly prizes in terms of uh, monetary prizes, you know, you get 20 quid for winning an evening in particular. There's always those incentives every week to, to just win the evening, not even... Um, not just be consistent, but just to go forward, not just pick up the points, but also uh, to try and pick up podiums and wins as well. So it really does lend itself to a tight championship. And I'll tell you, it's a circuit that I think we might be able to see quite a lot of side-by-side -side racing because it kind of lends itself to that. I think it does. Let's take a quick look, of course. Beautifully done. Uh, it's almost like he's following our cues. Uh, the Twin Ring Motegi, 14 turns, just under uh, three miles, just under five kilometers as well. It's fast, it's flowing, it's undulating. Basically, it's a Japanese circuit. Yeah, um, it, and it's a bit of a, it's more of a, um, it's well used, I think, is the term at the moment. MotoGP, of course, have been here uh, for the last few years and it often gets good uh, attention in a lot of the Japanese, uh, Japanese championships, whether that be single-seater uh, or touring car or other forms of motorsport, but it does get quite a lot of use, and for good reason, it's a very good circuit, uh, and it, it is good for overtaking, you can just see from the track map a few good little areas for overtaking, you think down at turn one, down at turn three, and then of course down that long back straight after the hairpin, so there's lots of opportunity here, and I think some of these guys are really going to be looking uh, to make moves where they can, but knowing that the second you make a move, the driver behind is going to have a nice slipstream down the next straight. Very true. So as we move our way into that 12 minute qualifying, should be very interesting to see obviously how important track position is going to be. Of course, we have two 25 minute races, the usual format for those familiar. If those of you that are new, hello, welcome. We don't bite. Make sure you do stay uh, and enjoy some beautiful touring car racing. Two 25 minute races, the first of which is set by the qualifying result. The second of which is a reverse top 10 of the race one finishing order. So. 
We touched on Motegi being fairly good in terms of the overtakes, the slipstream, uh, you know, all the recipes that you need for a good race. How important then is that qualifying session going to be? I think it's going to be key in terms of you want to get a good start to the evening. But of course, as we've mentioned all the way through the season, the reverse grid race uh, or race grid element for race two, where the top 10 in race one are reversed, means that you can get a good result in qualifying. You can get a fantastic result in race one. You're still going to have to work your way through the field in race two. Uh, and there isn't really any benefit of points uh, between race one and race two. They are the same um, point system. So it's going to be interesting. I mean, of course, you get a point for pole. So a lot of these guys will be hoping just to pick up an extra little point. But I think maybe mainly, I think, qualifying is good for your confidence uh, at a track like this because all, although you may struggle uh, to work through the back in race two, it gives you that little element of... A little bit of a boost, I should say, uh, as you go through race one, knowing you've got the pace on the others for race two. Yeah, uh, and morale is very important. Uh, the good thing is, um, is that as a champion driver, of course, you know, the, the ideal situation is pole, win, fast slap, uh, of course, then win and faster slap. That's ideal. That is optimum. That is Max Verstappen levels of dominance. Realistically, that's not going to happen, is it? The, the best way to win this championship might not even necessarily be to win a race. I mean, Pavel Mukonen is up there. I believe he's managed to win one, maybe two uh, so far this season. But he's up there purely because each and every single race, whether it's a, a normal race or the reverse grid race, he's up there in the, in the top five, in the top four, top three, that area. And that's really the big priority uh, of sort of dual race format championships it's making the boast out of the uh, make, making the best out of the evening as a whole as opposed to the races individually yeah and, that, and that's very true i think we also have marvin mackenberg up in uh, p6 in the championship who hasn't even got a podium yet so it just shows that um, you don't have to be right at the front of the field to be picking up good points at every single race even if you finish fifth a couple of times in the evening you're still picking up nice consistent points uh, first and tenth i mean if you finish uh, if, if you qualify and pole uh, win the race and then start tenth and finish tenth then you're going to pick up 26 points if you finish fifth and fifth you're going to pick up 22 and if you finish fourth and fourth you're going to pick up 26 as well so you don't have to be getting those headline results as long as you are keeping yourself near the front of the field and making a couple of moves here and there you're going to keep yourself plodding along quite nicely in the championship and picking up exactly what you need uh, to, to launch a championship challenge particularly when we get towards the end of the season of course you know, 10 round season, it's not the longest, and you want points on the board in the first half of the season, which will end next week at Spa, but these guys, they know what they need to do, uh, and right now, it's going to go qualifying them. That is, put in the best lap time you possibly can, and to be fair, the twin ring Motegi, it's quite a long one uh, in terms of these touring cars, of course, not extensive amounts of straight line speed, uh, and also a lot of technical around the Motegi. It's a fun circuit, don't get me wrong, but it definitely does take a little while for these cars to lap it. So, uh, let's follow on, let's see uh, who is going to be the one to take pole, and of course, get themselves that all-important uh, all bonus point, because at the moment, top three in the championship, uh, of course, funnily enough, uh, we have just been informed, Pavel Mikkonen isn't here tonight. Um, of course, it's almost as if maybe maybe it's Mother's Day or, or, or something. I don't know. Maybe people have a life uh, and they would, you know, maybe best to spend that with, with family. I don't know. Whatever whatever tickles their fancy, really. Of course, happy Mother's Day to, to all those uh, wonderful people out there. Uh, of course, you are all very, very greatly appreciated. Um, but yeah, obviously for tonight, but the, the championship as a whole, the top three separated by seven points. One point, add that over the course of the 10 round season, you know, the 10 qualifying sessions that we should have. There's 10 points right there just for pole points you can make up the championship gap for the top three and a little bit more it's not much but it's something yeah and i mean i think for some of these guys they'll know that um getting the extra point for pole can win you a title later on down the line it doesn't take much uh, in a very tight field just to put yourself over the line in terms of winning uh, winning that title and getting yourself a, a nice boost uh, of cash as well so it all matters it all really does um count 
uh, in terms of the championship, you've got to think in the long run as well. You can't just be thinking about, oh, okay, I'll settle for second, I'll settle for third. You need to be trying to get further near the front because with that point for pole, you're giving yourself just that little bit of an edge in the championship. If you come to the final round, and, for example, you lead the championship by three points and you get pole, that makes it four. That's just that little bit more difficult. That might just be a position uh, where you can afford to, you know, be slightly further behind your rival than you already are. So, you know, it, it swings and roundabouts, but it just gives you that little bit of an edge all the way through the season. And it's going to be interesting to see who picks it up. But you, Hash, he's got a very good time on the board at the moment. He does. Uh, so looking very strong uh, has uh, Christian Newhash, who week in week out does impress uh, in fairness Gaspar Rack up there Gregor Hujek up there interestingly as well Mary Zabdir at uh, less than four tenths of a second off pole position can't deep it too much we're less than halfway through the session right now people will improve people will find time but that's positives for Zabdir who to be fair when we took to uh, Imola of course a, a week ago his pace did not quite do his race well his race results didn't quite do his pace justice it's nice to see that finally we're starting to sort of see the pull back in his hand uh, on race room of course is quite uh, quite a beast uh, to be reckoned with he is a very very fast driver we're looking actually his bench for uh now puts himself to the top of the time sheet in that red and black machine but yeah i mean mario zabda he is there in any kind of uh in any form of of car really on race room and he is up there all the time particularly uh, in ranked events where of course you get um, some of the ranked championship uh, events as well so full credit to him and it's nice to see him up there as well only half a second just under off of bench Farkash but don't count him out as well because we seem to have a couple of groups going around at the moment uh, on their qualifying runs and I think it might come down to the last runs because to see you can set a lap time right at the end as you can see there you have five thousandths clear yeah that's not a lot uh, of course you hash and Farkash uh, I'd probably say are two of the quickest drivers on one lap pace, uh, especially Farkash. The, the, to be fair, the entire hung Hungarian contingent of this championship uh, are mega when it comes to one lap pace. But Farkash in particular, so for you, Hash, I'd say that's even more of an impressive feat, but very, very close. At a near two minute lap time, with, uh, a, of course, a good 14 turns, a lot of technicality, for the entirety of the top 10 to be separated by less than three quarters of a second, you have to go down to 13th before you break the second mar uh, margin. That's not a lot. No, it's not, and, and you can just lose it with a bad exit in one of these corners. I mean, we've got long straights here, bad error, you're thinking, um, out of the hairpin down at turn 10, and it's going to hurt you all the way down towards turn 11, uh, which could cost you nearly half a second, depending on how bad the moment is. So these guys really doing a good job to keep it close, and it shows us that we may get, once again, some fantastic racing uh, in the TX um, Motorsport Super Touring Championship once again at Motegi. Uh, Bench Farkash going to come to the line again. Can he improve on his time? Uh, let's see. Yes, he can. He puts himself another half attempt in front. I think comes back into the pit lane. But it just seems ever tighter. That's now 13 drivers. Uh, pretty much four, uh, well, 80% 80 80 of a second. That is not good math. But you know what I mean. Eight tenths away. Um, no, it is 80% of a second. It is 80% of a second, but I, no one ever, I don't know who ever says that. Um, what, what was it you said it. yesterday? Oh, yeah, 10 tenths. That's the one. Um, yeah, that, that was what we were, we were talking about when it comes to maths. Uh, also, Darren, speaking of tens, what was this championship called? T6. What did you call it? T6, didn't I? You called it TX. Oh, did I? Oh, gosh. I know, shameful, um, really, isn't it? It's fine, it's fine. I called uh, LMP, I called LMP3s, LMP2s yesterday. Um, so it's fine. Uh, I just wanted to, to bring you up on it because I'm horrible. So, you know, you use... Ladies and gentlemen, by the way, I would just like to clarify, Dara Thacker has a bingo card for commentating with Zach Sweeney, right? And he ticks off different sheets depending on how much I rinse him throughout a broadcast. I would just like to, to, let, the, to let everyone know of that sheer disrespect that this man has for me um, when it comes to... Uh, when it comes to helping him with, with commentary work and everything like that, um, I, I think I'm right to give him a couple of digs. But no, he has a bingo card, which not only is the most conservative thing I think I've ever seen, 
uh, is also probably the most Darith Acker thing that I've ever seen. Nonetheless, into the final three minutes of qualifying, that means that those that are starting their laps now, uh, basically for the next minute, are going to be the ones that are on to their final lap times. Not much in it at all. Gregor Hujek and Christian Juhash separated by two thousandths of a second. The entirety of the top three by less than half of a tenth. Yeah, I mean, it is pretty close there at the top, isn't it? And of course, we've not got too much longer uh, for these guys to get to the line if they want one more lap. And I think we're going to see Christian Newhouse just about get there in time. Of course, as we always say, this is the race room platform. When that timer hits zero in qualifying, that is the end of the session. There is no uh, there is no more time to improve your lap. So, uh, whereas in other series, of course, the, uh, the clock hits zero, you can finish that lap you're on. No, you've got to imagine that... That zero is however long the lap is here, so you've got to get to the line in time, and you have might just about do that. He's coming to the final few corners now in the Slovakian, of course, right in that championship battle. But can he improve? Let's see as he gets to the line. This could very well be his last attempt, uh, and I think it will be as he will go no quicker. Uh, but it, that time would have been good enough for P4 on its own. So uh, good consistency, I think it's fair to say, for some of these drivers. Exactly that, uh, which of course is where the vast majority of the points are scored. Yeah, you get one for pole. If you can keep up consistent pace throughout the entirety of the 25 minute races, not looking too bad. Two purple sectors for Marvin Mackenberg, by the way, yet to score a podium so far this season. He's looking mightily strong on this final lap. Now, is that a blessing or is it a burden for him? Of course, I suppose the overall uh, priority has to be the overall championship. But at the same time, if he's able to stay in the lead of that cup prize money, he's guaranteed 40 quid. Yeah, and that's not bad, is it? But I think he will be just knowing that it's not particularly a curse because he knows that he can pick up the cup championship if he, does, if he can't manage to get a podium in the end. But let's see what his time's going to be. He goes P2. He joins that group at the front. Three hundredths of a second is the gap. And let's see if anybody else uh, can improve as they get to the line. His brother, Sven Mackenberg, uh, goes within a quarter of a second up into P7. And the times are so, so close. Um, and we're talking about the top 10 within half a second now, not quite two thirds or three quarters of a second, within half a second and is uh, fantastic to see. Uh, David Santiago, I don't think he's going to get anywhere near the line in time to finish his lap and I think he's going to have to settle with starting 25th. Yeah, which is uh, of course a shame, no one really fancies starting that far down, but... Uh, after qualifying, that uh, is the uh, the end result. Look at that. Four drivers within half a tenth of a second. It's Ben Sparkash, though. I told you that man and one lap pace uh, are like two peas in a pod. Marvin Mackenberg, though, for the first time this season, qualifies on the front row. Ahead of Gregor Hujek and Christian Juhash, row two. Championship leader, Gaspar Rack crowns off the top five alongside Matej Mikovic, who keeps him company on row three. Sven Mackenberg ahead of Christian Orban, with Marius Sabdit and Pascal Jean Pretz that makes up the top 10 contingent. Stu Neal, Jacek Kovalevsky inside the top 12 ahead of Nenad Vladisavlovic in P13. Michael Klaff will keep him company on row 7 as Shores Oyser rounds off the top 15. Then comes Matev uh, Kozlov, Deslo uh, Koch, and then comes Sergei Mukhamov, uh, Simon Trebek, and a couple of others just to round it off. Fraser Rostans, uh, Berko Turdic, uh, and then comes uh, Eskivoski behind that uh, goes Fabio Gill, a couple more drivers to get our way through. Then comes, of course, Onion uh, Opnicic uh, uh, to round off 24 cars for this race this evening. Bit of a warm-up session before we get going then, Dara, and a couple of people taking to the track. I I've got, I again, I'll always say it, I don't understand why. I mean, you know, you just keep yourself fresh, keep yourself in the mood. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, normally when you get five minutes, you know, I run to get a, a glass of water or you know to the loo before the race because that's never a good thing if you need that during the race but i mean these guys if they're if they're ready they might as well go for it i just wanted to mention randomly actually that just at the end of qualifying there we showed a, a driver uh, who was i think in 26th place at the time and i spent the last minute trying to find out the flag i think they were a driver from the cayman islands i may be wrong but i've just spent the last minute trying to find out which flag that was um because I'm, I'm a nerd like that. But no, uh, about these guys going out in warm I think Bench Farkash just kind of keep himself fresh. He knows that he has to uh, drive away from the lead, and maybe he's just trying to practice those opening corners a bit. Maybe so. I, I mean, if I ever went out during a warm-up session, it was to do a practice start. It was to go out on track, stop, go, stop, go, stop. Sort of just in that sequence, just to make myself familiar with that, because... 
it's uh, a sequence of the race that maybe lasts 10 seconds, right? At most, from, from lights to maybe turn one, 10 seconds. And yet it can decide the entire trajectory of the next 25 minutes. Yeah, it can be so important. It just depends as well exactly which line you're taking into turn one. It depends if you're on the outside, if you're on the inside. A little mistake from someone uh, on the outside line or the inside line can compromise. You can, you can never uh, tell that's going to happen before it does. It's so, so difficult for these guys. Uh, we've only got a minute left of warm-up, so Bench Farkash has got about a lap in, and we'll get about another well, half, third of a lap, where he hasn't actually got there yet. That was my eyes deceiving me, but, uh, I mean, I mean, you are right about um, the fact that you really just want to do a practice start, because in different cars, when you drive lots of different cars, the start can feel very different, can't it? It can. They're obviously, from front-wheel drive to, to rear-wheel drive, with front-wheel drive, of course, um, as you accelerate, the entire weight of the car wants to go backwards. With them being front-wheel drive cars, that actually lifts the, the, the front end up, lifts the back end down, which is great for rear-wheel drive cars because it puts more focus on that rear axle. For front-wheel drive cars, though, it lifts up that contact patch on the front and actually makes the wheel spin a little bit more, braking traction. So I would argue that front-wheel drive cars are actually their own sort of specialty to get a good start in. Whether that is gradually building up the revs, dumping the clutch uh, as soon as the light goes out, whatever it is, there has to be a way these drivers maximise it because, as we say, it is a very important part of the race. Here at Motegi, uh, of course, it's not the longest run into turn of one, which makes that acceleration zone that much more important. And it's, and it's so true to say because, of course, uh, especially down at turn one, uh, it runs its way in towards that straight going down towards turn two. So. There's, it's an element to this track that we don't see somewhere like, um, for example, Imola that we were at um, last week. It's more like a spa that we're going to next week, of course, when we go down towards the Camel Scrape. We're going to have to find out because we're all lining up on the grid, and I am very much looking forward to this 25-minute race. Me too. Of course, they are all lining themselves up. Five red lights will come on. And we'll find our way barreling towards turn number one. A couple of people still in the pit lane, so it'd be nice if you could get a move on, lads. That would be much, much appreciated. A couple more people uh, to get themselves on. Of course, this is week four of ten of the T6 Motorsport Super Touring Championship. Season number three, of course, we've had two. You can see our reigning champion and, of course, two-time champion of Lloyd Bidoff in the YouTube chat. We'll focus on him in a minute because these guys are going to take to the grid. 25 minutes on the clock. Five red lights are on. And for the second week in Japan, Twin Ring Motegi is underway. Ben Farkash from pole position. Then let's see what he can do as they barrel their way towards turn number one. The Hungarian, though, able to solidify his position. Juhasz trying to uh, find a way to attack. There's, of course, Marvin Mackenberg joining him on the front row. No attack able to be made through the first couple of corners. In fairness, you don't really see much going on. A couple of overtakes in the background. But so far, so clean for at least the top five. Yeah, no one's gone airborne like we saw in Super Formula last year around this track as Bench Farkas nicely controls his way through turn two. A couple of moves near the back, of course, you need to keep your eye out for that P10 position throughout this race. P10, reverse grid pole, P11, he'll start P11 for race two. Marvin Mackenberg and Gregor Hujak are not going to allow Bench Farkas to get away easily, though, of course. Uh, they were so, so close in qualifying, so I think, especially with a bit of slipstream for some of these guys, we're going to see quite a big train for the lead if we don't see some early moves tried by the likes of Christian Newhash trying to put his way back up into that podium position. Yeah, of course he is a little bit ways down uh, in the championship and he wants to work his way forward. His pace is staggering, his aggression uh, sometimes over the line. Uh, of course after last week he's had a bit of an old slap on the wrist. But I don't think that's going to slow him down too much in terms of his aggression. A little bit of battling further back. Sven Mackenberg having a tussle with this Swiss driver. Of course, Pascal Jean Pretch there off the road. I believe that's Turdic uh, in the background. Indeed, it is the Serbian dropping to 23rd place now behind his countryman uh, of Oplicic. Uh, now out of the final corner for the first time, we tick off lap number one. Uh, and, oh no we don't, this is the run towards turn 11. Well, my bad, it's a start finish straight nonetheless. Uh, but yeah, we uh, find a way going into the next braking zone, ducking and diving Sven Mackenberg trying to find his way past. He's got Christian Orban and Marish Zabdir fighting for sixth just ahead of him. It's a very hectic uh, way to kickstart this race. 
Yeah, I made the same mistake, thinking that was the start finish. Going qualifying, it's very easy to do because it looks exactly the same. Here comes Mario Zappi, uh, right on the back of uh, Christian Orbans. Sven McIlroy not had the best of starts, and Gaspar Marac even worse. He's now right at the back of the field uh, and falling even further. So it's not looking good for one of our championship contenders here this evening. The likes of Gregor Hujek are going to be very pleased to see that. Uh, but Bench Farkat has got away well. There are gaps starting to form a little bit between Martin Mikiewicz and Chris Orban as these two, uh, or I say, as uh, Orban and Zabdi fight away. But, I mean, behind them, you can just see how tight it is all the way down the field. And, um, yeah, I think people may be starting to wait a little bit. They don't want to compromise their start position for race two if they can help it uh, very early in race one. That's the very true thing. Again, it's the compromise these drivers are having to make the balancing act in their heads. Yes, 22 minutes left of this race. Plenty of opportunity for things to change. But it's Farkash at the front, building uh, a gap ahead of Marvin Mackenberg. The entirety of the top four unchanged. Matt Mikovic able to get himself ahead of Christian Orban. Uh, uh, of course, who's up the play. Oh, well, no, Mikovic started ahead of Orban anyway. So they've all been able to get themselves ahead uh, of a couple of drivers who unfortunately have tumbled down at the order a little bit. Christian Newhash, though, on the back of this fight for second, led the way, of course, by Marvin Mackenberg. These three have to be careful, though, because right now, they're okay. Ben Farkash is still within touching distance. The moment they catalyze a battle is the moment that the Hungarian will run away with a win. Yeah, they can't really afford to let that happen at all. But they'll know, of course, that in race two, uh, the roles will be reversed. And if you finish ahead, you will start behind if you're in this top ten. Look at that, Christian Orban at, in the background there, uh, trying to break the slipstream down into towards turn 11. As we see Christian Newhash uh, in the shot now, really trying to pressure Gregor Hujek through the final couple of corners here. But the Petr Farkash is starting to run away a little bit here. The gap near enough a second. Uh, and Marvin Mackenberg is at risk of maybe losing a little bit of that increased slipstream effect and coming under a bit of pressure from the Slovenian behind. Find out in due course, of course, a little bit wide. Is Gregor Hujek going through the uh, double apex right-hander? Of course, let's see if uh, he's able to find his way through. I don't quite think Yuhash uh, has found the opportunity in towards, of course, uh, the next breaking zone, which is going to be at turn number three. This left-hander, again, not quite close enough. So Yuhash showing his intention, showing his cards. The opportunity not quite arising is Mackenberg as well. His driving doesn't seem to be overly tidy in the early stages. And that's all going to be inviting Hujek to maybe send that move. Yeah, and we'll see if Hujek is going to make it anyway. He's sitting in behind uh, quite nicely at the moment, just biding his time, twiddling his thumbs. Um, and maybe doing some accounting while he's at it as well. Uh, but let's see. First five minutes in this race. Still not very far, of course. As we look back now to this battle with Nenad Vladislavievich right on the back of Michael Clough, who's had a good start up a couple of positions, and he'll be after the top ten. I think Stu Neal and uh, Pascal jean Pret uh, are fighting over that at the moment, but you really want to be inside that top ten by the end of the race. That's the all-important thing, and of course right now the gap between P10 and P11, only nine tenths of a second, teetering on the edge of a second, and yet it will separate ten places going in to race number two. So it's all important that they're going to close that gap. And for Kobolevsky, he's right on the threshold whereby it's almost a case of, I need to find my way past. However, that is very uh, touch and go. Michael Clough having to go defensive. That's going to allow, of course, the stealth black uh, livery of Shores Oyster to find his way past uh, Vada Savlovich. Now downhill in towards turn 11. You can see Shores Oyster trying to set up two and two. Not quite close enough on that occasion as the Serbian does get very, very close to the rear end of the Flying Dutchman. Shores Oyster there driving a bad race, top 10 potential definitely there. Yeah, and we'll have to see what he can do, of course, he's not had the best of starts to the season, he had a, uh, I think he, he was the driver that went airborne at Aragon, if my memory serves me uh, correctly, as he's going to try to defend to the inside. Michael Clough, I think maybe just giving him a bit of slipstream there to try and defend uh, from Vladis Labovic, not too sure, but as they run down in towards the first corner, we'll have to see very deep though from the Dutchman it's going to allow all Vladis Lavijevic up the inside and the Serbian has seen the gap he's gone for it and he's trying to say thank you very much but he was always certain not going to let him through too easily and this will run down towards turn two and turn three but I think Oyster's is going to have the inside line for this double left he should be able to control it but Vladis Lavijevic keeping his foot in all the way around the outside 
He's going to give it a go. Not quite got the agility, though, in the end, and Shaw Zoysa hangs on uh, for that 13th place. However, in doing so, losing a little bit of time to the pink and white machine. Michael Clough, who's there in 12th place. We'll see if they're able to reclose that gap because, of course, they're going to want to. That's the all-important train potentially leading them all the way to Stu Neal for P10. That's going to be slipstream. They don't want to lose 18 minutes left to go. We have Los Gasman Rack, of course, the championship leader today. Pavel Mukonen isn't here. He's going to be taking a drop. We've also noticed Alessandro Ottaviani isn't here either. So he's going to be, uh, I believe, just signed actually with RHE Esports. Uh, so maybe taking some focus to, uh, uh, of course, maximise his run in the DTM Race Room Esports Championship. But for whatever reason, yeah, Gaspar Rack now out of it. And that could well mean that we're seeing both of our championship leaders, of course, of Rack and Mukonen, take their drop score uh, this week, which opens the door for plenty more people to be uh, banging some good points. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's what we're going to see a lot of these drivers look at because they can uh, gain quite a few points here on the likes of Marak because Marak will start P26 he's got a long long road uh, of recovery to try and put himself back into a point scoring position in the top 15 with, uh, with Usa uh, into the final few corners and you can see that defensive line through 12 and 13 that he's taking to try and fend off Ladislav Ivic, but it's not working too much in terms of losing time to Michael Clough at this stage of the race but look at this second third and fourth inside line I think that's Christian Newark there's a lot of contact there and he nearly spins around Gregor Hudrek as they just about make their way through pointing in a straight line it's given Marvin Mackenberg a bit of an opportunity to run away in second place here Gregor Hudrek defending the inside line will keep the position uh, but I don't think he'll be too pleased that he got a bit of a laugh out there from uh, Yuhash no, I don't think he's going to be overly uh, appreciative, no. Uh, of course, Yuhash getting a little bit close. Uh, and once again, going for it, is Hujek going to take a more passive stance? No, he's not. He broke later, I think, just as a statement to Yuhash to say, no, this time, no, you don't. Uh, not happening on my watch. Let's see. Hujek through the right as they run their way uphill towards the back end of the circuit. That, uh, of course, uh, car just behind the door. Esports liveried machine of Christian Yuhash looks menacing in the rearview mirror. The way he's driving so close to him, constantly searching for a gap, that's got to be putting Kujek on uh, you know, at an unease. Yeah, I mean, you don't really like it when someone's moving around in your mirrors, particularly into quite a lot of the corners, just taking an alternative line, making you think about your line, making you think about whether you could try something different. But if you do, it might allow a little bit of a room up the inside, uh, uh, potentially, for example, uh, turn seven, eight, like we saw there, uh, for a driver just to stick their nose in and try and get the move done. Well, while this is going on, though, Bench Farkash, look at that gap he's pulled, one and a half seconds now out front. Uh, but as we said earlier, you can pick up pole, you can pick up the first win, but then you're going to have to work your way through the field from 10th, and you can't really practice racing with other drivers uh, on your own, can you? It really is in the moment, and you've got to find your way through. So it's going to be a different challenge in race two for our race leader currently, but we never know who he's got to get through uh, for the lead. Look at this, though, side by side. This is uh, Jasek Kovalevsky trying to make his way through on Vlade Zlavivic. Vlade fending him off for now. The Serbian not having the best of time so far. No, he's not, of course, uh, usually described as the tank, as the wall, whatever you really want to put Vlade Zlavivic down as. The defensive prowess that he's got is, uh, well, coming in handy today, that's for sure, but uh, not allowing him to make much of advancements forward is the Serbian, he's there in 12th, about a second off Michael Clough, who himself is about a couple of seconds off Stu Neal. So, of course, Neal looking more and more comfortable for that reverse grid pole, and that's a good thing to have, a good margin to have, and at this point, it's almost a case of, does he even sort of push after Pascal jean Grietch? purely because right now, if they stay as they are, they're effectively guaranteed a spot inside the top 10. Yeah, they are, but, but let's find uh, let's find out and see, because, I mean, we've got a few drivers as well for the back. Oh, there's a bit of a love tap there from, um, I believe that was Zabdir on the back of Mikiewicz. Zabdir uh, having a good opening race, gaining a couple of positions. Um, but the likes of uh, Michael Clough gaining quite a few positions so far. Bit of a gap uh, ahead to screw Neil, but that can be closed in an instant, especially if a lot of these guys start fighting uh, up in front and everyone kind of uh, Constantina's up behind the battle but uh, we're nearly halfway through the opening race and we're still seeing quite a lot of battles throughout the field I mean the entire field spread for 25 cars is still only 21 seconds so it's still quite a tightly packed field if you make a mistake here 
could find yourself losing upwards of five, maybe even ten positions here. So, um, got to keep an eye out. Got to make sure you don't make any mistakes at this stage of the race, because like we've said, it, your your race one result is going to directly impact your race two starting position. So, you really want to go for it in race two, but make sure you're leaving a little bit in reserve during race one. Exactly that. You don't want to show your hands entirely in race one and not really have anything left to give in race two. Approaching the half distance mark then of this race, Ben Farkash leads us on to lap seven. As uh, will probably be lap 14, maybe lap 15. Of the yeah, of course, the end of the race decided by the uh, time is equal zero. That will then indicate that the lap that they're currently on is the final lap of the race. So we will see as to how things change. This battle right here, Matej Mikovic, the Hungarian at the moment, sat seventh. He's got sight of Mary Sabdir, who's recently moved past into sixth. And it's nice to see the pole finally, and like we said in qualifying, finding his own, finding his feet, and getting into a rhythm that suits him. A P6, it's not where he wants to be in terms of results, but considering the season he's had so far, it's something that he's going to take. And to be fair, a top five, Christian Orban only just ahead of him. Exactly. I mean, uh, a few good moves as well through the field. I mean, uh, Mario Zabbi is starting P9 up to P6. He might be starting a little bit higher up at this rate as well. P5, we'll see what he can do from there. So uh, opportunities are really quite uh, present for quite a few moves. Uh, and into race two. Um, I noticed that we've lost another driver in the form of uh, Duploy, um, the, the, the man from the Cayman Islands, um, where it's a much nicer temperature than it is here, uh, but he will start from P25 in race two. But yeah, I mean, we've still got 11 minutes here and the trains are still tight, but I think these drivers are just kind of biding their time and waiting because no one seems too keen at the moment. No, they don't. Uh, maybe just, uh, again, holding some in reserve for that final couple uh, of laps, that final sprint to the finish, whatever it is. So are we settling on the fact it's a can't or are we settling on the fact it's a won't for some of these drivers? I think it's a won't, uh, realistically, because the likes here, Pascal Jean Pretre, he's really quite close up onto the back of uh, Sven Mackenberg. And if he really wanted to, he could try and make a bit of a scent, put Sven Mackenberg off the line. But at the moment, he's just sitting in behind following the car through. I mean, a few of these guys, well, the battles are tight. Uh, I mean, we've seen Gregor Hudrek and um, Juhash. There's a tenth in it between those two drivers, one or two tenths. Um, so Juhash could absolutely try and stick a nose in somewhere and make the move stick, but he's just waiting at the uh, for the time being. I think come the end of this race and race two, we might see something different, but look at this, to the inside now, Sven Mackenberg. Uh, benefiting from a small mistake from Arthur Mikiewicz and the Swiss driver John Preich might follow him through here but he's going to go around the outside at turn five uh, but he won't even have to because that's going to be Mikiewicz slotting back into the queue. Yeah he's uh, again I think happy just to stay where he is uh, in where obviously everyone is uh, they're, they're all inside the top ten of course Mikiewicz not really making the most progress so far this race but the more they fight, the more people they reel in, and the more chance they have of losing more positions and therefore more time uh, for race two. Of course, at the moment, they can afford to lose one more place, any more than that, and they're going to be way out of contention for race two, and that's the last thing any of their, uh, any of these guys want. So maybe it's a case of cutting your losses in race one as to maximise the evening's result in race two. Fight here. Christian Orban trying to get the up and under on Marius Sabdir. Of course, the pole now being forced to go defensive. One once again, this isn't the start finish straight, uh, it's the run towards turn 11, the downhill run. Look at how steep that incline is. Christian Orban searching for the gap, not quite able to find the way through, but look how much more track he's using relative to the pole, really trying to find a gap through. Difficult to send it too late on the brakes there when you're going downhill in that manner, because of course uh, the car will slow, uh, naturally slow a little bit, um, a little bit slower when you're going downhill. Of course, gravity and momentum will benefit to that. It's a contrast to what we see at the likes of uh, the Red Bull Ring up at turn three, where you can really try and send it late on the brakes and hope that gravity comes to your aid as well. But it's difficult down at turn 11 to really try and place the car in the best place to make that move stick. But as it is, uh, Christian Orban, he's still in behind. If these two start fighting, Sven Mackenberg, Pascal jean Pret, and uh, Martin Mikovic might join the battle. But as is, you can see Sven Mackenberg there feeling a need to go defensive into turn two, but he comes out ahead. 
look at the Swiss driver who's looking for a line up the inside but just comes out behind but there are starting to become a, a few more battles here and some drivers a little bit more keen for some extra points. Well, I mean, yeah, points do win championships at the end of the day. Uh, and when it comes to the T6 Motorsport Super Touring Championship, uh, points and championships mean prize money. Uh, I think we calculated what, about 1,300 quid worth of total prize money throughout the entirety of the season. That's a lot. Obviously, thanks to our wonderful sponsors, the hard work from Rich and Pascal behind the scenes. Uh, and, yeah, those sponsors, of course, the track sponsors that... that, that, that feature on the graphics every single week and then of course the likes of Imperial Wheat and Fish, Udressi Garage, uh, Marsh de Moob and then Team Fondue as well uh, for all of their help behind the scenes and making sure that these guys have got the prize money to make sure they're motivated to stay in this hunt because not being funny for pretend race cars to be coming away with uh, £285 for a championship win plus whatever you can get weekly it's not bad going no, it's not. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say no to that personally uh, if you offered it to me. But, I mean, I'm not that quick and I know exactly what you're lining up to say, Zach. So uh, I'll get in there before you do. But um, I, I think that some of these guys, uh, a little bit extra cash in their back pocket is not going to hurt them at all, especially with uh, lots of platforms requiring, you know, you spend a little bit of money for some extra content. Um, a lot of these drivers, you know, use it on some of that to progress their aims in other championships to get some more cars just to get faster Germany now that's wide from Christian Uhash though the Slovakian oh a little bit of door banging there with Gregor Hudrek but that was far too wide in turn one to be comfortable and I think Hudrek might try one around the outside at turn two here oh maybe so Uhash of course now has the inside line going into three then into four of course it's going to be difficult to do but I think he's managed to get the job done beautifully done uh, from the Slovakian of you, Hash. One of the two into the next breaking zone and no way through, uh, of course, for Hujek, who is... No. Uh, I'll look it back up in a second. I always forget. It's fine. Hujek is behind, regardless. Uh, they're in fourth. Vince Farkash, though, has dominated this race from start to finish. Mackenberg doing a brilliant job as consolidating that second place. All of these guys locked in this battle for, for, for P2. Yeah, it's a nice little train, isn't it, um, in this battle? I mean, we've got a few moves as well. I mean, Mario Zabi is up four, but in this little group of cars, Yuhash has got through on Gregor Hujak, and that is a little bit of a tap on the rear end by Yuhash. But of course, Hujak will start in front of Yuhash once again in race two, if it was to stay like this, and Yuhash is going to have to do it all over again. Down into turn 11, they go. Look how close they get uh, through the mid corner. Then on the acceleration, it looks like Hujak has a little bit of an edge here, and he's got a nice double slipstream all the way down into turn 11 this downhill braking zone as we said difficult to really send the car but he looked for the move to the inside and he's in as much curb on the outside as the Slovakian of you hash uh, but it hasn't lost him too much time but as we go through um, as we go through the final couple of corners five minutes and 20 left I think we're gonna have three more laps here just about thank you for uh, dropping it in I know I know every time you do that you're doing me a favor by calling them by their nationality because I'm useless. I got an A, A star in geography in my GCSEs. Uh, I just, yeah, when it comes to the uh, Baltic flags as such, those guys, that, that side of thing, uh, that's very close to the rear end of uh, Uhash, by the way. Greg Hujek getting uh, remarkably uncomfortably close to the rear end of the Slovakian um, as they run their way towards turn number three. Once again, late on the brakes, who's latest? Mark McAvoy doing a brilliant job as to just maintain the pace more than anything. The battle for P10, more importantly, Vada Savlovic on the back of Stu Neal. Of course, Neal, for the most part of this race, has been fairly comfortable. Now, where it matters most, he might have to be looking over his shoulder. Yeah, and I mean, Michael Clough, who was in that P11 spot, has dropped back a little bit, hasn't he? And, uh, and, and Shaw's Usa as well. We've got Kovalevsky in P12, but he's a little bit further back. It's really Stu Neal against Nenad Valdez-Slavievich as they run their way through and the Serbian has had some great pace over the last few laps uh, on that very much purple car. Uh, you can't miss it, can you? Uh, the British driver deciding that he would go for a deep purple car uh, this year. But Valdez-Slavievich, he wants to find a way through. He wants that reverse grid pole and he wants a chance at a podium at least from a victory uh, this evening. But he's got to find a way through and I think this is the this is the kind of battle that we're going to see really heat up in the closing laps in race one. He's got to bring in everything and even a little bit more. Three minutes 40 on the clock. It all depends as to when 
Vince Farkash crosses the line, 4.2 separating them uh, and the lead, but nothing separating the fight for second. Yuhash couldn't quite decide which way he wanted to go. He settles for the outside later on the brakes, but not able to keep the speed up. Hujek closes the gap. Now into the final couple of corners to round off the lap. Then, of course, you go to 12, 13, and then 14. Here we are. Uh, of course, it's all about putting your foot to the floor. 3.15 at the line. This is going to be the penultimate lap of the race. Vince Farkash, home free for victory. Yeah, I mean, he's very much clear in a way the, the runaway leader in this race. Four and a half seconds now in just over 20 minutes, having a very, very nice evening so far. But of course, it's going to get more difficult in about five minutes' time. Christy Newhash right on the tail of Marvin Mackenberg. He really has been ducking and diving, hasn't he, over the last lap or so as he lets through Newhash. Is that maybe a slowdown penalty? It looks like um, he slowed down a bit, but it's a weird one there. It is. Uh, I would assume definitely slow down or um, no. I, I think slow down really is the is the only feasible explanation for, for that. I'm entirely sure as to where he did exceed track limits. Uh, but yeah, you can get those in race room. Uh, at least to the, the best of my knowledge, you do get a, a slowdown that you have uh, got to serve within a certain allotted amount of time. And then of course they have got instant points that go with that. Very similar to the i racing penalty system 1x for contact and 2x for uh, 1x for going off road and 2x for spinning 4x for contact whatever um, uh, it's the same in race room and you have got to be mindful of that but you can also get those slow down penalties and I think it's something that you have just been victim of which allows Gregor Kujak to put some pressure on Mackenberg as they run their way towards the final lap yeah there's the one more lap to go when they cross the line Ben Farkas can just have a nice Sunday evening drive uh, and cruise his way around this twin Rinmatagi circuit as we now see second, third and fourth dive their way down towards turn 11. All while this is going on really, Mario Zabdir and Christy Norban have really started to close into this paddle there. The gap now between Yuhash and Zabdir only now a single second as Hujek looking for an inside line here on uh, on Marvin Mackenberg. He was fourth at the start of this lap. Could he be second when they cross the line to end it? Going around the outside at turn 14. Just about going off track but he's going to be just ever so slightly ahead. Marvin Mackenberg, remember, he's not had a podium this season. If he gets doubly overtaken here, that run might continue but Hujek on the outside. They're going to be three wide into the corner. Yuhash going for both of them. There's a little bit of contact and here comes Abdir and Orban in all of this. It's all kicking off then with 54 seconds on the clock. Hujek now behind Mackenberg and Juhash, who of course are now neck and neck on that run towards turn three. The German has the inside line. The Dory Esports driver getting pushed to go to the outside by Gregor Hujek. Marvin Mackenberg showcasing a valiant defence with less than a lap left to go in race one. That he hasn't had one so far this season. Uh, it would do him quite well in the championship as well, particularly against the likes of Yuhash and Hujek, who he is up there with. But, I mean, look at Marius Sabdi and Christian Orban. They were nowhere near this battle just a lap ago. They have got a chance at the top four, and they are not going to say no if the door is open to it. But, I mean, Yuhash still looking around, ducking and diving for a move here as they run their way in towards turn nine through this long left hander up towards, oh, sorry, seven and eight before we get towards um, the long, um, or the hairpin, I should say at turn 10 but I mean Marvin Mackenberg he's trying to defend but Yuhash is doing absolutely everything he can to put him off he's throwing everything and even a little bit more uh, at the German of course there's just a handful of corners left to go in this race of course it'll be Ben Farkash no doubt in my mind that will take the victory of this race now of course it's whoever can put their foot to the floor first this isn't the run to the line they've got a little bit longer is Mackenberg going to be able to hang on he's got four cars behind him Let's see, uh, they are two, three, four, five, and six as they run their way down the hill. It's Yuhash to the outside, Mackenberg to the inside, and the Slovakian trying to dance his way, tiptoeing around the outside. It's not going to work out, and he's got to be careful because Hudrek might look for an inside move if he can, but I think with only a couple of corners to go, Mackenberg has just about held them off, but is there going to be a final corner send from Yuhash? No, Mackenberg's going to hold it. He is, and of course, Ben Farkash is going to come across the line victorious for race number one. Marvin Mackenberg, the first time this season, will take to the podium, the second place on the podium. Of course, Christian Juhasz rounds it off with Marius Sabdir, a sensational fourth place finish for the pole. Uh, of course, everyone else completing the top 10 in the end. Vladislav Levic uh, was able to take to the final place. Sergei Mukhamov there at 15th run you through the final classification in just a minute but what an end to that race bring on race number two uh, of course in a few moments time we'll come back uh, after the results and, and everything have a small little break and then we'll bring you back 
for 25 more minutes of racing action. But Motegi once again, not really ever disappointing uh, to Rudic across the line, the final driver. And there we go. There are the results. Ben Farkash in the end converts pole to victory ahead of Marvin Mackenberg, Christian Newhash and Marius Sabdir 2, 3 and 4. Christian Orban rounds off the top five with a very hard fought battle amongst everyone. Gregor Hujek, Pascal Jean Piet just in behind. Uh, Sven Mackenberg, another top 10 for him as Matej Mikovic and Nena Vanasavlovic, the top 10 of that be the front row for race two. Stu Neal close but no cigar for him in P11. Then comes Klaff and Kovalevsky, Shores Oysa and Mukamov round off the top 15. Simon Trebek, Choke, Rostance, Gil, Santiago the top 20 ahead of Opicic, Eskivoski, uh, Tarudic, Kozlov and then deploy uh, the lone DNF of this race. Oh no actually that was of course that was Gaspar Rack. So must have just gone the championship leader. Uh, Greg Ishijek by the way gets the fastest lap for that race. Race two moments away, though. 25 minutes left on the clock in terms of the racing action here today. Who's going to come out on top in the top 10 reverse grid? We'll find out in just a moment.
Welcome back then, ladies and gentlemen. Race two of week four of the T6 Motorsport Super Touring Championship three is about to get itself underway. Myself, Zach Sweeney, still alongside Darren Thack in the comments booth as race two, as I say, about to get itself underway. The warm-up is done, the formation about to start, and Dara, before we get going, who's coming out on top? Oh, I do not know. I mean, any of these drivers... I mean, Bench Farkash clearly has quite a bit of pace in the car, but he's got to get through nine drivers. And at the quality of racing that we saw in race one, it's going to be difficult for him to do so, you'd say. Um, I did notice that in the uh, in the YouTube chat, Marvin Mackenberg said that he definitely won't be able to sleep after this event. So um, he's obviously having a bit of a stressful time, but hopefully it's a little bit easier on him for race two. But I can't see how it is going to get any easier, because he's going to start a little bit more in that pack. But... Um, oh, I really don't know. I'm going to go with... You know what? I'm going to say Valis Lavivich is going to get it. Um, just about sneaking to the top ten, and he's going to pull away for the win as everyone fights behind. It's a bold claim. I, uh, I respect the... Uh... The, I don't want to say audacity, because I definitely do back Vladis Avovic for going for a win. Maybe we will see the tank take to the top step. Five red lights once again, 25 minutes on the clock. Race two here at Motegi. Of course, T6 Motorsport Super Tour and Championship 3. Week 4 about to get itself underway. And Marvin Mackenberg with a drive-through penalty after his first podium of the season. That is not the way he wants to kickstart the rest of his evening. Side by side once again. That's Matej Mikovic trying to find his way through. And already into the race lead. The Serbian, though, not going to back down without a fight as they battle their way through the first sector towards turn number 3. And a perfect start for the Hungarian. And then he tell me, Adam, I'm sorry for saying that he was going to win the race because he's already down to second. And here comes Sven Mackenberg for third. Uh, his brother with that drive-through penalty is just going to ruin his evening, uh, really, in terms of this second race. But they are too wide through the mid-pack. As you can see, Bench Farkash trying to run through the inside at turn three. But will it help him uh, on the run down for turn four? Sven Mackenberg looking to promote himself up into the top two. But it's a very, very, uh, very effective start uh, at the front from uh, our race leader. But just in behind. The trains are the train is tight, I should say, and here's Marius Abbey looking for a move. He's looking for it, of course, side by side. As Marvin Mackenberg defends, of course, not ideal with his drive through penalty. Zabdi trying to find his way past, but no space in the end. That battle coming to a swift conclusion. Mikovic, though, uh, able to consolidate the lead for now. Marius Zabdi putting some pressure on. Race one winner Benz Farkash already up two places. And Zabdi forcing the issue, prying a gap open as they run their way towards turn number 10. It's the outside line. Let's see what's going to happen as they run their way in towards, of course, that very long straight. See as we run our way all the way through this long hairpin at turn 10. Zabdir locking wheels nearly with Marvin Mackenberg, who of course uh, will surely peel into the pit lane at the end of this lap. He's just doing a bit of a hold up job, maybe helping his brother out a touch uh, as Bench Farkash lurks in behind. Michael Clough, uh, a man with a very good start, of course, started outside the top 10, but now into ninth place. As we see, um, that's going to be uh, Zabdir trying to find his way through, can't quite do it as Marvin Mackenberg peels into the pit lane. Uh, releasing uh, uh, Zabdir to go up to Wolfsburg and Hudrek who themselves had a good start. So a few drivers who started at the back end of the top 10 promoting themselves up early. Slowly but surely, still plenty of time for them to do it, but the best time to pounce is right at the start where everyone uh, is close together, everyone is bunched up. Ben Farkash there in seventh place. Marius Zabdit alongside. Let's see if the race one winner is able to promote himself. Not quite. Michael Clough inside the top ten, by the way. What a sensational start that was for him. The up and under for Ben Farkash, though, is there. Zabdi gives him the space. The red and black. Ben Farkash take a bow as he nearly finds his way past. Zabdi, though, with a bit of door-to-door -door ding dong between the pair of them as they run their way towards turn number five. Ben Farkash once again on the outside. Not quite able to convert this time through not but he's really really trying to force the issue here up um four places that's but i think he's up three uh, from starting in p10 but let's see as they run their way through turn seven and eight trying to find his way through but not going to be able to michael clough though doing a very very good job at the moment a good, again wasn't in the top 10 but he's really sticking it with the guys that were sitting in the top five from race one so full credit uh, to the British driver there, but Benj Farkas trying to force his way through. The gap really is between Hujek and, and uh, Zabdir because Mikivic holding up the top five a little bit at the moment. Yeah, 
trying to, uh, uh, of course, fight their way themselves. Michael Clough, though, wants to get on with things and say, oh, come on, boys. I know I finished P, uh, P12 in the last race, but I still want to get a move on. I still want to be fighting my way forward. Let's not diddle dally. Let's not twiddle our thumbs back here. Let's work forward. He's there now trying not to get on the inside of turn 11. However, Farkash remarkably late on the brakes. Still 21 minutes left to go in this race. They work their way through the winding final sector. Of course, Marius Sabda able to build a bit of a gap because of it. There is that lead train, though. Mikovic doing everyone a favor. Ivana Sablovic, of course, right behind him, keeping everyone nicely in touch together. You can see the entirety of the top five all in one nice long train. Yeah, and this is massive for the championship if, in terms of the fact that we've got um, we've got Yuhash near the back, Gaspar Marak nowhere to be seen on the timing tower. Uh, and Pavel McConey not here. So the top three drivers uh, in the championship not really going to be scoring any points. Ottaviani isn't here. Uh, so Mate Mikiewicz is in a really good position to pick up some very, very important points here. And he's winning the race. He's doing exactly what he needs to be doing in this scenario. But he just needs to try and pull away from Vladislavievich, who isn't as in that fight. So this is an absolutely golden opportunity for the Hungarian driver. But Vladislavievich just reminding him he's there, giving him a couple of taps into some of these corners but not really doing him any harm no i think more just uh, little love taps than anything not doing it any harm just just showing he's there maybe a bit of bump drafting whatever the, the, the cause may be it does happen as long as there's no harm i don't really see much issue with that vada sablovic though i have to say despite the poor start i'm impressed with uh, i'm impressed with his pace to stay with Mikovic because I honestly thought that once the Hungarian was through that was it he was going to run away and Vada Sablovic was going to commit for P2 however it's actually getting to the point that the Williams Esports Chill Blast liveried machine is having to go defensive yeah it's trying to he's trying to keep uh, that position just making sure that Alizavivic doesn't look up the inside but all while doing so he's compromising his exits particularly down this main uh, long straight towards turn 11 uh, he's easy enough going to be back on the racing line no real challenge from Vladislavovic for now but this top five so tightly packed at the moment through here I mean even if you look at the top what 11 less than five seconds split them all and we're over, uh, I think this is the end of lap three in this race so such good racing so far and we'll just wait to see anybody really try and make an assertive move in this race yeah no one going for that cut through do or die which to be fair i can't blame them for as such it's difficult to to want to do that with still most of the race left to go it, 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 it's not a case where you can ride the rest of the race on the line it's not so much worth going for that do or die set where you have to go for that move otherwise the race is over because there's time to wait and bide your time and maybe do it in a more civil way as such. Vanis Abovic hasn't got to go for an almighty send on Mikovic because he knows there's time to wait and bide his time. Give it 15 minutes and we might see a different kettle of fish entirely. Yeah, we'll have to keep an eye on all of this uh, as we go through the rest of the race. But like I said before, this is a massive race for the championship um, because the top guys are nowhere to be found in terms of the points battle. So we've got a few drivers who really the championship could take a massive upturn in this race and so it's a little bit extra pressure uh, round four of ten here in Mategi this is where you want to be uh, putting yourself in the mix for trying to be up there by the end of the season by the time we get to the final few rounds uh, with the last three rounds of course being uh, a Bathurst, Sepang and the Nordschleife you don't really want to be chasing points at the Nordschleife but we'll wait and see Schwarz Oyser uh, the Dutchman trying to find a way through on Kovalevsky uh, but these guys, again, not far behind Neil, uh, Kla, Farkash. It's a tightly packed bunch. Um, and I think after a few laps, we're going to see quite a lot of side-by-side -side action with these guys, just like we saw at the end of race one. I think so. And it is just going to boil up to that point. The tension is going to rise, and it's going to get to a point where it is going to tip over a little bit. The, the lid's going to start popping off, and that's when we're going to see some great action. It's just patience. It's a waiting game. Right now, it's a small price to pay for the bar swimming fishing. Fin fishing? Nice. Yeah, good English, Zach. No, I'm, I'm great. Um, just, just give me a sec. Right, we're good. I, I just had to clear my chakras and get rid of all the negative energy that was making me not speak English right there. Uh, but yeah, the, a small price to pay for the bar swimming finish that we're going to get at the end of this race. 16 minutes, 45 seconds still on the clock. Battles all the way through. Sure, always once again, tantalizingly close to a top 10. 
Yeah, ooh, that was a bit of a, a lunge there, it seemed, from Sven Mackenberg to try and put himself up into P2, and it's allowing uh, Mikiewicz to try and gain away a little bit. That gap up to four tenths, it's not much, uh, but it is enough to uh, make him feel a little bit safer than he was. John Pret as well, the Swiss driver, looking to try and make a move himself. So it just kind of has this um, collective effect, doesn't it? If you look for the move um, on the driver in second, the driver behind you is going to look for the move on you the third and the same happens between fourth and fifth so it, it all just bunches the field up with Sven Mackenberg not in the best of lines through this middle sector uh, but I'm sure we're going to see some fantastic racing action at uh, the end of race one really was some absolutely fantastic side-by-side -side racing between the guys at the front some of the quickest drivers not just in this league but on the race room platform entirely so fantastic to see uh, but as they run their way up to turn 11 once again it seems but Mickey Mitch is having a little bit of a break at the moment. Four tenths still is that gap, maybe five tenths. It's for Mackenberg, not as close as he once was either. No, dropping back a little bit. Mikivic breaking the toe, staying all the way over to the right-hand side until the last possible moment. Of course, interestingly, Vada Savovic not following him. Interesting to see the as well the, the diversity in the lines going into turn 11. Mikivic is a driver that is really enjoying using all of that curb on the left going in. Whereas the rest of them not really too fast. I mean, surely it's a no-brainer to open up the radius of the corner. Even. Yeah, I mean, I don't see why they're not doing it, but at the same time, it doesn't seem that the drivers doing it are gaining that much time themselves. So, um, yeah, I, I, it's a bit of a 50-50 one, because of course you really want to give yourself as much chance to carry as much speed through the uh, middle of the corner as you can, but if it's not really going to help you out too much, then you maybe don't want to risk... Um, picking up a slowdown penalty for track limits uh, or a like something to do with that kind of worry I mean looking at that in the background actually just in behind I think that was a uh, few Neil Uso yeah Uso trying to get through on Kovalevsky for P9 so they're at the back end of the top 10 but you can see there in that black and red machine Bench Farkash he's lurking he's gaining he's three seconds off the lead with the pace he showed in race one if there's a big battle at the front don't count him out for sneaking up a few positions and maybe even getting a podium don't doubt it one bit. I think there's plenty of opportunity for each of these drivers. I mean, the, the, the good thing about this season is that we have got so many big names. We've got Greg Ishojek, Sven Mackenberg, well, the Mackenberg brothers, Jean Pietre, of course, the returning faces, Zabdir, Farkash, uh, of course, uh, Christian Orban, uh, Gaspar Rack, who, of course, is new to this season, however, not taking to the grid for race two. So many great names. And that is the perfect recipe for, for great racing because week in, week out, the running order is going to shift. Yeah, exactly. And, and it, it's always fun to see. It's always exciting uh, to not really know who's going to be at the front. You can kind of get a group of drivers in your mind. You're thinking, OK, we might be looking at a U-Hash, um, you know, a Mackenberg up near the top. But you never know who's going to be right at the top. And that is exactly uh, why we love this championship, particularly uh, as the field has ever got closer over the past season or so and I mean for yourself and I uh, Zach who often do ranked events uh, sitting in the commentary box as well it's great to see one of these guys fighting it out even more we see them uh, during ranked events oh there's a lot of contact there between Usa and that's Kovaleski Kovaleski just dipping a wheel into the gravel there it was difficult for them both to get through giving Stu Neal a little bit of a breather there but it got very very close uh, to a disaster for those guys and you can see a flashing of the lights by the pole Kovalevsky, but I was just going to say that um, it's always nice to see these guys fighting week in, week out when, you know, uh, in ranked events, they may turn up, uh, you know, a monthly event or so. It's good to see them racing every week. It is. Uh, we get to see more of them. Uh, and yeah, those ranked events, always a lot of fun, but not everyone can attend them. They're not always everyone's cup of tea. And of course, they're only for, for pride. I mean, Sometimes, I mean, they are for sort of VRP, which for those unfamiliar with race group is the in-game currency as such. And you can win a real-life trophy, which is great. Don't quite think that stacks up to about 300 quid's worth of prize money for winning the championship in T6, though. So maybe the priority does shift uh, to the, obviously, the championships that they're in, as opposed to the rank stuff. Uh, either way, you are going to get some action. So, you know, make sure to tune in. If you're more of me and Narathaka, then uh, head over to the official race room stuff. Uh, not to take anything away from T6, because I love being here. These guys are absolutely sensational. Uh, and week in, week out, we get great racing. And the best thing about it is it is weekly. We don't have to wait very long at all between each round. We get it snappy, very, very snappy. Uh, and it's straight there as well. Continuing this battle is Ben Farkash and Marish Sabdir. 
Same battle, same positions, and yet still no progress forwards. No, it's, it's difficult for these guys to look at Farka actually looking around, weaving, trying to make the move. It's a very, very defensive line there from Mario Zabdir. Of course, he's got himself uh, around the place on the race through platform. Bench Farka as well, not being able to get through. These drivers will know each other very, very well. Uh, for many different series and they'll kind of know what they're going to get with each other uh, but Zabdi doing a good job for now just to defend uh, and keep his uh, car up in P6 for the time being uh, but it's been wake our way through 11 minutes to go you're looking at another six laps of this race six laps for this all to really spark uh, into a new life but I mean look at the battles behind there's a battle at the front battle uh, in for the back end of the top 10 and then you can see Us from Kovaleski going side by side as well keeping us interested still 10 minutes left to go Kovalevsky wanting that top 10 but Shaw's also only just able to get back into it so let's see once again the sleep black livery of Oyster under pressure Pulp lurking to the inside of turn three close enough though on that occasion as Oyster doing a brilliant job just holding his nerve as they pursue after Stu Neal who this time albeit on the less important one is inside the top 10 fairly comfortably yeah, he's doing a good job at the moment, Stu Neal. Uh, of course, he, he's, you know, he's picking up points in the championship. He's not a contender, you'd say, but he is picking up some consistent points. Always there or thereabouts uh, at the back end of the top ten and fighting for a, a reverse grid position quite up, uh, quite near the front of the field. Oh, dear, that's Marvin Mackerberg looking like he was having a moment, briefly causing a yellow flag. Dan in P21, uh, it's looking like no points on the table for him after his podium in the opening round this evening but I mean, the battles are close they are tight it's why we love the reverse grid races particularly because it is somewhat difficult for the drivers to get through even if they are a little bit quicker and it lends itself to this good tight and very close quarter racing that's Farkash looking to the inside of Maris Abdi talking of close quarters racing that is exactly what you want to see oh my goodness me pushed almost off the circuit is Farkash before he finally bails out and looks to the outside Marius Zabdi putting up a stone wall defence against the Hungarian which is 9 minutes 20 left to go interesting I've got to be honest with Zabdi being so persistent on this sixth place I mean of course he wants to lead the charge but at what point are they doing themselves more harm than good yeah, I, I think it's a difficult, um, it's difficult to manage, really, isn't it? Oh, as we see, is that a dive in front? No, I think that's uh, Gregor Hudrek trying to make a move on John, uh, on Pascal in P4. Uh, I think this is kind of the stage of the race where he thinks I've got to get a move on if I want to win this race. I've got to start to clear these cars relatively quickly here, uh, and he's got to get through if he can. Bench Farkash still looking around, but yeah, to your point, I think uh, Marius Abbott may be either thinking that. Um, he's not going to be able to get to that top five or the top five will start to drop back towards him when they battle and Bench Farkash is a bit of a competitor in terms of his championship battle for the moment so doesn't want to lose any points to him after losing points in race one and also the element of backing him up into Michael Clough uh, I, I think it's difficult to manage just in general because you do want to go forward but you don't want to lose a position and particularly to someone you're so close to in the championship exactly that it's all relative like we were saying yesterday really uh when it comes to championship points and stuff it doesn't matter where you finish as long as it's ahead of the people that matter exactly um and uh, when we come towards the end of the season the last couple of races we will see uh, the drivers i think play around a little bit more with their positions they know what they need uh to win the title or win the cup for example uh, if you are orban who currently leads that christine orban uh, after Mikiewicz picked up that, uh, not Mikiewicz, sorry, Mackenberg uh, got that podium. Orban is now in the cup leader's position. Uh, Bench Farkash, he's still looking for this move. Uh, but look at Michael Clough. He's really closed up here onto the back in that pink and white Arnage composition liveried car. Uh, but good defence at the moment from the Polish driver. He's really being quite astute in how he's defending the car and placing the car just to not allow Farkash to line up the inside. Yeah, of course, uh, 
yeah, sadly stop me, Farkash from getting his lines and Farkash doing all he can to actually go and get them, but unfortunately the inside not materialising for uh, the Hungarian on this particular occasion, not on this one either. Uh, again, holding his nerve brilliantly as Zabtir, the space opens up, though a small mistake, he broke a bit too late, and Benz Farkash is going to try and have a bite here inside line through turn two. It's going to turn to the outside, of course, for turn three. However, he has got the measure. He's got a slight advantage going into the braking zone. How hard is Zabdi going to fight this one? He's late on the brakes as well. Michael Clough sat idle, waiting for his opportunity to pounce. The inside nearly opens up. He gets his nose sliced off by Ben Farkash, and they all emerge as they were. Yeah, it's impressive how no one's really been able to make a position here, despite we, us having such clued and close racing. That's a very late send there from Bench Farkash, and Michael Clough is looking at this thinking, OK, I'm going to wait, I'm going to try and get a better exit. If you're going to dive it up the inside, I'm going to focus on my exit of the corner. Look at that inside line, just about sneaking his nose in. He's going to try and dance his way around the outside in that large competition delivery uh, machine. He can't quite do it, and all this is just allowing Zabdir to have a little bit of breathing room. Of course, we're talking a tenth or two, but it's not. at least he's not being pushed through this middle sector uh, by bench Farkash. I mean, at the front, uh, we're still as we were, but I mean, we can see it eating up back here. I'm sure it's going to start eating up at the front as well. I think so. Again, as the time ticks closer to zero, the tensions rise, and when tensions rise, racing drivers get a little bit uh, touchy-feely with each other as such. Uh, of course, there's not really much that they can do cockpit to cockpit, but they can definitely do it from door to door uh, as they rub and race. Ben Farkash looking to the outside. Let's see if he's able to beat off Marius Abdo going into turn 11. He gets the up and under. Beautiful stuff from the Hungarian as he gets the uh, move, but it's going to be the outside for the penultimate corner, then into 14. He's got to keep his nerve and again look to the inside, but oh my goodness me, running so close. Three to go at the line. Mikovic still doing a brilliant job as to hanging on. Uh, ben Farkash though, under pressure from Michael Clough. Yeah, he is, and I think Sven Ackerberg was also looking for a move for P2, but around the outside comes Michael Clough. He's not going to be able to make that one, I don't think, but here is the battle for second place. Uh, it's allowing Nicky Vich up the road, but Sven Ackerberg, he saw his brother took a podium and thought, yeah, I want a piece of that. I want to go one better and take a win. Let's see, around the outside at turn two. Oh, they get very close. I think there was a little bit of door banging into the second corner, but through the second part of this double left, Sven Ackerberg, he's not got enough momentum and he's not got enough speed to carry his way up into P2. He's going to have the outside line once again in towards turn four can he dance his way around the outside a very late move on the brakes but i think it's just going to be vladislavievich's corner as they run their way underneath the oval and i mean pascal and gasper just in behind they're looking at this thinking well the lead's running away we might have to try and make a move quickly to try and get a podium or even p2 here well yeah when do you push when do you sort of cut your losses for Mackenberg and Vladis Ablovich who have been you know, with each other for so long at what point do they say we're not catching Mikovic anymore should we just fight for second I think that's going to be down to Vladis uh, keenness to defend but also Mackenberg's uh, keenness to attack 350 on the clock Mikovic of course just brilliant job out in front not really been put under much pressure if any all race long Sven Mackenberg though trying to stay in the slipstream but he's got to keep an eye out for both Pascal Jean Piech and of course Gregor Hujek. Marius Sabdin not done himself any favours you can see that battle with Ben Farkas still continuing as they weave their way towards turn number 11 it's mainly the lead fight and it's broken off for the rest of the top 10 Yes, uh, Michael Clough has dropped a long way back from Farkash as well. A couple of seconds now is that gap. But it's incredible to think that with all that defending and all that fighting, Zabdir and Farkash are still just about five seconds off of the lead here. They've really not lost out too heavily uh, in terms of time. Uh, but these guys here, Sven Mackenberg and Vladislavovic, they really have. 1.2 behind now, but Sven Mackenberg being bold, being brave down the inside. There was contact, but Sven Mackenberg will argue that he left a little bit of room on the exit of turn one. And Pascal jean Prec, the Swiss driver, is going to say thank you very much and try and find his way around the outside. The inside line again, though, for Vladislavovic. He had it last time around and he, he was able to hold his position. And this time around, the same thing occurs. Look at Gregor Hujek in there. He's not done. He's looking for a move. And he might go to the inside here down into turn four. Let's see if he's able to get the uh, the space. Hujek eyeing it up, but not close enough. Jean Pietrun enough just to deter that move. About to start ourselves on to the final lap of this race. 2.20 on the clock. Zabdir Farkash settling their position for sixth place, but I'm sure that fight's far from over. I mean, the gap is nearing on a second. I think Farkash much quicker 
but Zabdi's valiant defence has really tainted Farkash's progress. Yeah, Farkash, um, he, he's not really been able to... Uh, oh, I mean, getting stuck, you'd say, behind Marriage Zabdi means P6 is probably his cap, but these guys, they're fighting hard, aren't they? Mikjevic, no mistakes, he's got this win in the bag, one and, the, and a third laps to go or so for him. But for Vadis Labovic and Sven Mackenberg, Pascal Jean Pretre and Gregor Hudek, this is not over by any means necessary. Yeah, you've got to throw everything at it more, well, now more than ever for these guys. It's their final opportunities coming in. Each corner that goes past is one more wasted. Vadis Labovic looking for the inside on Sven Mackenberg, who goes defensive into turn 11. Vadis Labovic, though, giving it a beautiful go to the outside. The Serbian keeping his foot in nicely, but the acceleration goes the way of the German, who's able to stay ahead in second. One more lap left to go for week four of the T6 Motorsport Super Touring Championship. It's led the way by Matej Mikovic. Once again, a Hungarian flies the flag out in front, but behind, it's a Mackenberg defending for second. Yeah, here we go then, down in towards the opening corner, and Vladis Lavovic not able to find a way through like Sven did uh, last time around, but you don't count out Pascal and Gregor here. A late send is very much on the card from any of these drivers, particularly the likes of Pascal who maybe wants a podium to round off his evening, but Sven Mackenberg trying to make it two Mackenberg podiums in two races. He looks relatively comfortable for now, but really, Nenard could try and move anywhere, and the Serbian might be able to put it off and put Sven offline and make him vulnerable here. He's just trying to deter him, obviously, put some pressure on and, and go for that final move. I mean, going into turn 11, Jean Pietro trying to find his way through, uh, and of course, not quite uh, close enough as of yet. Uh, of course, uh, you can see the Swissman trying to get involved in this fight by any means necessary. Vada Sablovic at working his way through. Apologies, by the way, that wasn't that was a little bit earlier on in the circuit. They're about to run their way towards turn 10 and then towards the end of the circuit. The Swissman, though, not quite close enough. Marius Zabdi and Benz Farkash, uh, of course, a few uh, places behind there in fighting for sixth. Only uh, a few more corners left to go. And this battle doesn't seem to be going anywhere. No, Ben Farkash may have made a bit of a mistake there, actually, because he looked relatively comfortable ahead of the uh, of Zabdir, but Zabdir back in front, but through turn 10. This is really the end of the race for these guys. It's the last overtaking opportunity that you would say is clear. Vladis Lavivich, he's going to surely send this one to the inside, but maybe Pascal's going to make the move. The Swiss driver, he's got the run, he's got the line, and he's going to be the one trying to promote himself to the podium. The Serbian Vladis Lavivich around the outside, just about going to hold it, but no, dipping a wheel into the gravel, he's going to lose it and Pascal Jean Prec he's not been in the podium positions all race long for the final three corners he is Mate Mikovic as well across the line he has driven superbly today at the twin ring Motegi it's two Hungarian victories from two Sven Mackenberg on the podium as well for the first time this season what an evening it was for the brothers Pascal Jean Prec I believe for the first time as well on to the podium Vada Savlovic not quite the win as Dara predicted, but a top five nonetheless. And Gregor Hujek up there at the highest placing of the championship contenders. Then comes Sabdur and Farkash. Of course, we'll run you through the final finishing order in a few moments time. But Matej Mikovic, take a bow. And what a race for him. I mean, dominant in his stride. And that's exactly what you need. Yeah, it was perfect for him to pick up some very, very good points. And the Hungarian winners, I'm sure they'll be very pleased for the uh, <laughs> to pick it up with the two of them. The parallels this evening. Matej Mikovic, a Hungarian victor. Sven Mackenberg, a Mackenberg P2. Pascal Jean Pretz uh, rounding off the podium with Vanessa Vlevich and Gregor Kujek inside the top five. Marius Zabdi, Benz Farkas, 6 and 7 with Michael Klaff in P8. Stu Neil and Jacek Kovalevsky round off the top 10 ahead of Christian Orban and Schulz Oyser once again close but no cigar for the two of them. Of course, uh, after the Mackenberg's podium, Orban is now the highest placed driver yet to finish on the podium. Be interested to see uh, how that dynamic shifts over the rest of the race. Mukamov, Rostans, Tribek, the top 15, head of Fabio Gil. Uh, Oplicic, Juhash, the fastest lap, but P18 for him. Choke, Mackenberg, Kozlov, and Eskivoski. Turidic, Santiago, Deploy, and Gaspar Rack not taking to the race this evening. Dara, today went by quite quickly, and I think that was down to the fact that these drivers put on such a good show. Yeah, I mean, we had uh, Motegi. You can overtake anywhere. We saw drivers go for it in turn one, turn two, turn four, turn ten, turn like everywhere around the circuit, and we were not short of action. We've got Spa next week, of course, uh, and once again, that's another track that 
lends itself, particularly in these touring cars, to some side-by-side action. Uh, and people want to go into the mid-season break with a very nice sum of points. Yeah, speaking of that mid-season break, yeah, in a week's time, of course, on the 17th of March, St. Patrick's Day, of course. So two weeks and two holidays for uh, everyone this uh, this year. Twin Remo Tegi today. In a week's time, we'll head to Spa. That's the halfway point of the season. A week's break, and we're back for Silverstone. The Slovakia Ring, Bathurst, Sepang, and the Nordschleife to round off season three of the T6 Motorsport Super Touring Championship. Ladies and gentlemen, that is going to round off our action today. Thank you for of course joining us in the youtube chat thank you for watching along congratulations to the drivers and a massive shout out to our track sponsors and to our season sponsors of imperial meat and fish udressi garage marche du Moube, and team fondue my name has been zach sweeney dareth Acker alongside me in the commentary booth and well this evening has been fun i'm sure spa will be absolutely no different make sure you tune in same time in a week it's goodbye for now <laughs>